friends. Uh, last week I met a very incredulous gentleman, a taxi driver. I was in this taxi cab and after a few blocks he said to me, say, you wouldn't happen to be, would you? And I said, yes. And <clears throat> he said, I wonder how I could ever convince anybody that you were in my cab. Well, I said, come to the office and I will autograph a book for you. And then you can show them the autograph. He said, they won't believe that you autographed it. They will think somebody else did. And he said, I want to show them when you're on television. I never get to see you on television. I have to earn my living, and Tuesday night I'm out hacking. He said, all right, here's five dollars. Next Tuesday night at eight o'clock, you go into a bar. <laughs> you give a dollar to the bartender and ask him, give him that as a tip. And then the four dollars is to pay for not driving your hack for a half hour. And then, uh, when we come on television, you can tell everybody at the bar. <laughs> I but he said, suppose they don't believe me. <laughs> well, I said, I tell you what I will do. Next Tuesday night, I'll tell the story. Then they'll have to believe you. <laughs> now I've paid my debt. Would it please you if tonight we talked on the subject of communism? And the reason we're going to talk about it is because there's considerable confusion in our American life about communism. There's much emotional hate of communism and not very much thinking and reasoning about it for a long time. And even at the present time. Americans generally judge communism by Russia's foreign policy. Now, communism is not to be judged by Russia's foreign policy. If it is, well, then when Russia's foreign policy is favorable to the United States or the Western world, we're apt to believe that communism is good. And when Russia's foreign policy is unfavorable to the Western world, then we fall into the mood of believing that communism is wrong. It is well to realize that communism is wrong independently of Russia's foreign policy. In this particular telecast, we will outline for you, and inasmuch as we have communist listeners, and we attempt to appeal to all listeners, we'll give them a little lesson in communist philosophy. And then for the benefit of the Americans, will tell you what is wrong with their philosophy. The two basic principles of communism, two of many, but we will have time only for these two, are first what is called economic determinism. The second basic principle is man has value only as a representative of an economic class. We'll take each of these in turn. And Inasmuch as my angel loves to blot out everything that is associated with communism, we'll give him a few seconds to do that. First, economic determinism. It sounds very, very learned. It means very simply, however, uh, that culture, civilization, art, religion, philosophy, and morals are all determined by economic methods of production. My, my angel is just barely getting out of the way here, I see. He, you see, he has an extra large wing spread, about 21 inches. Other angels only have 17 inches. It makes it a little harder for him. The communist principle is that 
At the base of society is economics. This is the base. Economic method of production. And everything else, literature, art, morals, politics, religion, all are based upon the methods of production. For example, if your method of production at any given period of history is based upon private property, such as we have here in our democracy, or what we call private enterprise. The communists argue that your literature, your art, your morals and philosophy are all a superstructure and are ultimately based upon economics, but of and by themselves have no value. For example, your literature must be what kind of literature, the communists say? A defense of private property. Your morals. Morals are based upon economics and hence, well, your commandments, the communists would say, are based on private property. Take, for example, the seventh and tenth commandments. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Communists say, can't you see that these two commandments are based upon private property? Stealing implies that particular method of production. So does the commandment not to covet your neighbor's goods? Politics then is based upon economics. You get a particular kind of a state which defends private property. Religion is based upon it. It's an opium, the communists say. It's a an opiate that is given to the workers to make them content with their exploitation, leading them to believe that there's another world to make up for this one. Now the communists say, if you change your method of production, and instead of having private property and private enterprise, you have socialism. In other words, if you put all of the property in the hands of the state, then you have a new literature, morals, art, and philosophy. What kind of a literature do you have? You have a literature which attacks capitalism. You have a literature which makes fun of America. You have a literature of hate. Your morals, you have a new morals based upon economics. Then what? is the basic thing that is wrong. Injuring or hurting state property or in any way betraying the revolutionary class. Art then becomes communist. And during the days here in the United States when we were having a honeymoon with Russia, there was a considerable amount of art that was communist inspired. You can see it in one of the big New York hotels today. You can see it in one of our public buildings. You can see it in some of the public buildings of Washington, inside and in murals. Art in which there are pictures of big, tremendous, muscular men with little heads pushing wheels. No brains, no freedom, just production. Man is an economic tool. This is what is known as economic determinism. In other words, economics determines everything. What is the fallacy? Well, the first fallacy with economic determinism is that Karl Marx, who studied philosophy and who should have known better, confused what is known as a condition and a cause. For example, A window is a condition of light, but a window is not the cause of light. We are willing to admit that economics to some extent does condition literature and art, but it certainly does not cause literature and art. The fallacy of Marx was to make condition equal determination, which was a logical fallacy. 
Not only is it logically wrong, it's historically wrong. If economics is the cause of culture, why is it that in the pre-Christian era, on the one hand, you had the great Hebrew civilization, and on the other hand, you had, for example, a civilization like the Babylonian, the Chaldean, and others. These civilizations were totally different in kind. They had different religions, different moral concepts, this being the highest moral concept that was now under man in the pre-Christian era. But their economic methods of production were identical. Therefore, economics does not cause the difference in cultures. Take, for example, the Christian era. Rome during the first three or four centuries, the Roman Empire, had exactly the same economic method of production when it was pagan as when it was Christian. But the civilization and the art and the religion and the morality were totally different. Therefore, it is not the economics that determines civilization. The economics has gone to the head of the communist, almost like wine to an empty stomach. But notice that whenever they appeal to our Western world, whenever they would try to convince us of the superiority of their own system and our weakness, what words do they use? They say, for example, that we are immoral in germ warfare when they spread that lie. They tell us that capitalism is unjust. They tell us that the way people are treated in the United States is unethical. We ask, by what right and what authority do communists ever use the words right and wrong? If everything is economically determined, ethics right and wrong, truth and error do not belong in the economic categories. Communism is strong only when it borrows some of the moral indignation that has been inherited from the Hebraic Christian tradition. And communism is weak when it departs from that tradition. In other words, they have bootlegged all of the decency and morality that have come from the great Hebraic Christian tradition of the Western world. And they use it in order to condemn us, which is a reminder of how we ought to meet communism. In the voice of America and elsewhere, not be talking about the supremacy of economics, because whenever we talk about the supremacy of economics, we are paying tribute to the communist era of the primacy of economics. They are speaking to the rest of the world in terms of ethics. We are speaking to the Western world, to the West, rest of the world, rather, in terms of economics. They are using the language that we ought to be using. We who pride ourselves on being moral and on being right. Then there is another uh, aspect of communism, and that particular one is that man has value only inasmuch as he is a member of a class. In one of his earlier writings, Karl Marx, who was the founder of communism, said, we have already destroyed the outer priest. Now we must destroy the inner priest. That is to say, man's clerical spiritual nature. Then follows this very remarkable statement in which Marx very correctly tells us the essence of democracy. And Marx knows the essence of democracy far better than many who enjoy it. Marx said, democracy is founded on the principle of the sovereign worth of every person. 
This in its turn is based upon a postulate, a dream, and an illusion of Christianity, namely that every man has an immortal soul. Then coming to the first edition of his work on capital, Marx said, Persons of and by themselves have no value. An individual has a value only in as much as he is a representative of an economic category and belongs to a certain revolutionary class. Outside of that, no value. And Molotov more recently, carrying on that philosophy, Develop the idea that bread is a political weapon. A political weapon. We thought that it was food for the hungry, regardless of who they are. Molotov said, no, bread is only to be given to certain people, those who share your own political revolutionary ideas. This is the basic principle of communism. And so true is it. Remember some years ago, Haywood Broon told me there was a cartoonist on the, one of the communist sheets in New York. And the cartoonist developed cancer, was unable to work. And Haywood Broon went to the communists and asked them if they would not give him some pension or help pay his hospital bills. And the answer that he received from the communists was, He's of no use to us. He no longer is a member of a revolutionary class. And therefore, for us, he does not exist. That was good communism, but it's not good humanitarianism. That explains liquidation. The individual has no value. What it actually is, is an application to the human order of what prevails in the lower realm of biology where individuals perish in order that the species may survive. An individual fly, an individual gnat, an individual ant is of no consequence in the lower biological orders. What is of importance is the species. Marx and communism have taken that notion out of biology, lower biology, and applied it to man. And says that what happens to an individual man is of no consequence. What is of importance alone is the revolutionary class, namely the species, communism. That explains what we have seen and read about in Korea, namely the communist tanks running over the bodies of their wounded. No one would ever take them out of the path of any of their great machines because they're of no worth. It also explains the way they attacked our UN forces. The first line of attack carried guns. The second line of attack would carry mattresses, throw themselves upon barbed wire, be shot. The second group would also come up unarmed, and the third group would have guns. We in democracy would never do that to men. Every man is precious. Every soldier is precious. And this liquidation, Man in the modern world is not going to be met just simply by protest of horror. It means that we have to recognize the evil of this particular philosophy and begin affirming in the United States not just mass culture. We perhaps have had too much of that, namely an emphasis upon humanity. As Hitler put the emphasis upon race, as Mussolini put it upon nation, and as the communists are putting it upon a class, it is now high time to affirm in education 
in politics and everywhere else, the sovereign work of the individual. And that means that man has to get back to the true democratic concept, which Marx, rec Marx recognized, namely that every man is a soul. What we are attempting to do now in our Western world is to preserve the fruits of Christianity without its roots. That cannot be done. And what is unfortunate is that we of the Western world have the truth, but we have no seal, we have no fire. What has happened to the great patriots, to our great champions of righteousness? The communists have stolen the Pentecostal fires. They have the seal, but no truth. And we with the truth must also have heat and passion and fire, the kind of fire that the Savior came to cast upon the earth. Communists are right in saying this world needs a revolution, but not their cheap kind, which merely transfers booty and loot out of one man's pocket into another. We need the kind of a revolution in the United States and in the rest of the world that will purge out of a man's heart pride and covetousness and lust and anger and envy and gluttony and sloth. In other words, the true battle against communism begins within the heart of every single American. It means the recovery of our own great tradition, of our belief in God, of an affirmation in politics and an economic life, and among our politicians, of the things that are right and true before God. Then we need not fear communism, for if God is with us, then who can be against us?